morning. I was just asked uh, impromptu to say something about the Stone Center. Uh, nothing would make me happier, so I'll try to keep that at under four hours. Um, the Stone Center is a relatively new research center located at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I don't think I have to tell any of you what the City University of New York is uh, in this room. Um, but you may not know, maybe everyone doesn't know, that there are 25 campuses. One of them is focused on graduate education, and that's where we're sitting. And inside the Graduate Center are a large number of research centers, about 35, and one of them is ours, the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. Uh, we opened our doors in January of 2017, and briefly we're a group of six uh, professors, uh, myself, uh, Miles, Leslie uh, McCall, who's my co-author, and also a co-author of Deirdre's, uh, Paul Krugman, Branko Milanovic, and Salvatore Morelli. So we've all come together, the six of us. We do diverse work, but all of it relates to inequality. Uh, it's all quantitative, a lot of our work is cross-national, and we're all focused on uh, policy implications. We have a staff of four, uh, a large number of students, and, and four incoming postdocs. So uh, what to say to this group, if you're interested in learning more about us, go on our website, which will be easy to find, the Stone Center. Um, and sign up for our newsletter and announcements. We do a lot of public programming at the Graduate Center, about four or six events a year on inequality on our big stages. We have a small internal seminar series, a uh, more academic on inequality. We welcome to join those. And uh, we have two annual lecture series, one on wealth inequality, one on income inequality. And I'll just close by saying that we've been working on something for almost a year that I'm very, we're all excited about it. Sometime this summer, we're gonna launch a new website. We've never had a website that had research content and news on it, uh, but we've been designing that. It'll come out sometime this summer, be a place to look for academic research, but also blogging, the graph of the week, news, uh, and, and archives, and, and also uh, it will point you to uh, available data sources. We're connected to the Luxembourg Income Study, uh, now known as LIST, which is a 30-year-old data archive in Luxembourg that I've worked with actually for 30 years. And we house, uh, that, that's a data archive located in Luxembourg. My paper's gonna use the data there. Uh, and so you'll see a little bit more about that. And we house the US Office of LIST, uh, which is sitting here at CUNY, a place where we do fundraising and outreach and talking to journalists and uh, students and teaching. So I hopefully that's a good introduction and we'd love to see you um, at our events. So let me hit my, my clock here. Okay, what I'm talking about today, um, I'm talking about inequality, and I'm talking specifically about the issue of the interplay between women's earnings, women's contribution to household income, and inequality across households. I'm gonna look uh, at inequality in general, but I'm also gonna look a little bit further down uh, at the middle of the income distribution, and also um, at the bottom. It's worth noting there's an enormous academic literature, as I'm sure many of you know, in large policy communities uh, connected to that literature that's focused on women's employment, on gender gaps in women's employment and earnings and occupation, uh, many different aspects of, of women's engagement in paid labor. There's also, of course, an enormous literature on income inequality, increasingly on wealth inequality. There's actually a relatively small literature that joins the two. Uh, and so that's one thing that, uh, one reason I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity uh, to, to, to bring that down to you all today. So um, I'm gonna present some work that's done jointly with two colleagues of mine, Susan Baird, and Dragon's daughter, and my colleague, uh, Leslie McCall, uh, at the Stone Center. Okay, so first of all, just as a bit of background before I get to that, um, we were actually commissioned, I, I'm showing you a paper that's a bit of an odd fit for today. Uh, we were commissioned to do a paper for the French Development Agency, actually the French version of USAID, looking at this question, the interplay between women's earnings uh, and the household income distribution. The overarching question is, do women's contributions to household income, do they mitigate or exacerbate income inequality across households, and to what extent do they mitigate uh, poverty in particular, and do they influence the probability that households uh, attain a, a middle income status? So because it's a development agency, they were interested in uh, both middle income and high income countries. So this is actually a study of five Latin American countries and five English speaking countries, one of which is the US. So I'm saying that uh, partly to explain that um, it's a little bit of an odd fit for today. I'm really, although the slides have Latin American countries and the Anglophone countries in there, I'm really just gonna focus on the English speaking countries making just a few comments because a lot of our interest today is in policies and institutions that shape the outcomes. And of course, the institutional and policy context in Latin America is really quite different. It also does though provide some very interesting sort of uh, comparison cases because 
just jump ahead a little bit, one reason we were focused on Latin America is that during the last 30 years, when income inequality was rising dramatically in most of the rich countries, it was falling quite markedly throughout Latin America. Uh, also, women's employment was rising quite rapidly there. So it was one reason it was an interesting case. I'm going to leave it largely aside today um, until, uh, perhaps until the questions. Okay, so we started really with three overarching questions. What share of household income packages is contributed by women's household, uh, by female household members? Um, and that includes both earnings that women bring into the household, but also public transfers that are connected to them as individuals. Um, and then our, one of our questions, which again I'm going to focus on a little less today, is um, to what extent is the cross-national variation in the share of the household income package that comes from women, to what extent is that explained, how is that explained? Is it really differences at employment levels or differences in the type and remuneration of women who are in employment? This question about women's role, women's contribution to the household income package, which is actually a rather technical question and one that I've, I've done quite a lot of work on, I'm really raising it here in service of the more applied question, is do women's uh, contributions to household income women focus most on earnings, do they in fact mitigate or exacerbate income inequality that we've heard about so much about in recent years uh, across households? And to what extent do women's earnings enable their households to escape income poverty or to attain uh, middle income status? So once again, what I'm doing here, in addition to trying to relate these two literatures of what's happening with women's employment on the one hand to income inequality, which we hear so much about uh, on the other hand, um, the other thing that we're doing, perhaps it's obvious, is opening the black box of the household to look at what's happening among the partners in the household. The, through most of the literature that we've been hearing and most of the findings that we've been hearing in recent years about rising income inequality, you know, whether that's the Gini coefficient or the top 1%, the unit of analysis is almost always the household. And in, but in fact, households are made up of individuals and those individuals are different and have different economic contributions. So the data that we have, micro data, main data, at the level of persons and households enable us to go in the black box of the household and to disaggregate by gender. There are other disaggregations that we could do obviously as well, but our interest here um, was in gender. Okay, so it's often uh, said, and some of you may have heard this, there's been a fair amount of, although I'm noting that this academic literature is actually rather small, uh, there really has been a discussion in, in popular debates in the US uh, and, and in parts of Europe as well, asking the question, over time, we know, especially in the second half of the last century, dramatic increase in women's attachment to paid work, men's attachment to paid work was high uh, for the most part throughout that period, what has been the implication of women's increasing involvement in the labor market? So the story that was told, a popular story that sort of spread recently, um, is that women's uh, increasing connection to paid work, in other words, their growing contribution to the household was in fact disequalizing. And, this, and why is that? Well, that was because we often hear that there's also rising what's called assortative mating, or what sociologists call homogamy, people partnering with people who are like them. So the story is often told, you know, years ago the surgeon married the nurse, and now the surgeon marries the surgeon. So that the top of the income, you know, you can tell that a thousand times. So that, that in fact, women's increasing contributions to household income in combination with this assortative mating is blowing up the income distribution. I always remember hearing that taking home. Great, thanks, that's our fault, you know, that the uh, is growing. But I jumped into that literature, and in fact, a large literature that both studies this question over time and across countries has actually almost universally found the reverse, as have we in this paper. As you'll see, women's increasing attachment to the labor market is in fact equalizing, and why is that? Because over time, in particular, and across countries as well, it's pulling up the bottom more than it's pushing up the top, and while the assortative mating is disequalizing, it's, it's nowhere near as, as extreme as it's told in the popular story, and the net uh, effect is one that's equalizing. So especially, uh, Miles was pointing to the bottom half of the distribution, which is of course of great interest to, to many of us, interested in hardship in particular. Um, what happened in the period in the US, for sure, and after the Second World War, uh, and the whole latter part of the century, was uh, that many single earner households became double earner households, and that put a floor under the bottom. So that's been largely, uh, so that's been largely equalizing. But in which case, we wanted to look much more you know, closely at this um, empirically. Okay, let's speed up just a little bit. So uh, we've done several things in this paper, but one of them is uh, to ask this question in, in many different ways about the contribution of women's earnings to the household income distribution. Um, not just looking in the aggregate, although we do, but also looking at different parts 
of the distribution because the answer to that question, both within and across countries, is that it also varies by class. Okay. Um, you're going to see here a number of pictures I'm just going to show you quickly. Um, our analytic strategy was to look, as I said, I just want to linger on this for a moment. It's pretty easy in income and data sets to figure out how much people are bringing in in terms of, of wages, whether it's self-employment income or wage and salary. Um, but there is another source of income that people sort of, quote, bring to the table, and those are income transfers that are allocated to people individually. So we often think of income transfers at the household level, but people get unemployment compensation, maternity benefits, right, disability, pensions, and so forth. So we also, throughout this analysis, we not only look at individual earnings, we also look at the transfers, although in the interest of time, I'm not gonna say too much about that um, today. Okay, so very briefly, the data that we use here are the data from the Luxembourg Income Study, known as LIST that I just mentioned, cross-national database. Uh, it, it is actually in Luxembourg, available to researchers around the world. About 7,000 researchers are used the data in the last many years. We gather, we, I work with them as well, we gather data uh, now from over 50 countries, uh, 10 time periods, and we harmonize them into a common template so they can be used for research. Uh, and most of the research is on income, wealth distribution, earnings, um, and so forth. So the data sets used in this particular study, as I said, five Latin American countries, you can see them there, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. And they were, we compared them, we compared them to these five English speaking countries. Uh, Australia, Canada, Ireland, the UK, and the US. It's a little bit of an odd comparative structure. As I said, it came out of the, um, the development framework. We were trying to look at two relatively homogeneous groups of countries to help us uh, get a handle on institutional effects. Most of my own work has been comparing the Anglophone countries to the Western and Northern European countries, which also look quite different. So I'll say a little bit about that as I go along. Okay, just to note, for the purposes of, the, of this study, um, we selected heterosexual households that were headed by heterosexual couples, uh, and where both the, both of the, both of the um, partners in those couples were between the age I, I upset somebody over there um, between the age of 25 and 59. Why heterosexual couple, why couples and why heterosexual? Mostly because we're interested in divisions of labor by gender. Virtually everything that I'm going to say in my few minutes at the end about policy implications, of course. Uh, refer to a much more diverse uh, set of households. Okay. Households headed by same-sex couples, single-headed households, multi-generational households. But here mostly we're interested in this question of the contributions of partners to households. So that, that's the, the population. Um, the income variable, basically there's much to say about that, but we're focused on annual earnings, both wage and salary and self-employment, and we're also focused on these individualized income transfers. Um, the measures that we use, which should be pretty familiar to all of you by now, the Gini index, you're going to see that in just a few moments, a measure, a very common measure of income inequality across households, uh, a measure of other kinds of inequality across households, runs from zero to one. Um, and then we're going to, I'm going to show you poverty, some poverty analyses. Uh, poverty can be measured many different ways, but in the cross-national literature, we usually use these relative measures where we declare, we declare, we de de designate a household as poor. Uh, if its total household income falls at less than some percentage of the median, usually 40 or 50, the European Union uses 60. Um, so in other words, it's, it's a relative measure and placing, uh, defining poverty as how much people have relative to essentially the standard of living in their own country. And then the middle class, this is something we could talk about for any questions or I'd be happy to talk about later, a literature that I've been quite involved in also. What, what is the meaning of the middle class? In cross-national and in a lot of work in the US, we define the middle class mostly because the data allow us to do it much more precisely. Um, we use as a proxy essentially the, 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 the middle of the income distribution. Uh, sometimes it's the middle 60 or the middle 40, something like this, but something that's quite common is to put a band around the median, so we define the middle class as households with income between 75 and 150, et cetera. In this particular example I'm going to give you, uh, we're going to define middle class households as, as middle income households from 50 to 150. So that's the methodological uh, summary. There, uh, I'm just going to show you quickly some um, of our empirical results and then talk about policy implications, which of course, in my view, are mostly about uh, shoring up women's attachment to the labor market, in particular their employment rates, because that's what uh, our findings uh, point to. Okay, I'm going to show three quick pictures. These are probably not all that easy to read, but the Latin American countries on the left, you can start on the Lego side, um, and the five English-speaking countries on the right. And what you see here is the blue is women's earnings. So in the U.S., 
when they're contributing 36% of the household income package. Uh, the green are uh, the male earnings in that particular case. Um, it's uh, close to um, it's 73%, which is close to three quarters. A fair amount of uniformity among the Anglophone countries. You can see women's contributions are substantially less uh, in the Latin American countries. Now, there's something a little bit unusual in this graph, but I just want to point to it quickly because um, you're, this is the income definition that you're going to see when I move on quickly to inequality, poverty, and the middle class. The sum of his earnings, her earnings, and his transfers and her transfers are more than 100 in the Anglophone countries. Not true in Latin America. Why is that? Because there's the rest of the household package, household income package. When you think about income and income inequality, to remember there are a lot of moving parts in household income packages. So in addition to these four components, you're going to have the labor market income from other people in the household. You're going to have capital income coming into the household, social transfers attributed to other people, and social transfers, particularly means tested, that can't be allocated to individuals. Then this income concept that we use here, which is used almost universally uh, in, in income research, well, in the US and across nationally, it's also going to be net of taxes paid by the household. So what that means is in these five English-speaking countries, the rest of the package on average is negative. So there's more taxes paid out than the rest of that income that comes in. So I just put that up for you to realize that when you think about this, you really have to think carefully about the denominator. Just to simplify this a little bit, almost the same story here. Here we just, we're just we just zero summing it up to these same four um, uh, components. And you see a fairly similar outcome. So what's the important thing to see here across these Anglophone countries? Um, if women are bringing in about a third of these four, of the total of these four components, and men are bringing in about two thirds. Um, this type of research, when you constrain the total to the sum of these two, is another very common stream, especially in sociological research on the question of dependency, of, of, of interspousal uh, dependency. So I don't know, how would you read this? It's a little bit of a, I guess it's sort of a half full, half empty story. Um, when we think about women's contributions, and I'm going to move on again just a bit to inequality um, and poverty in the middle class, on the one hand, there's gender parity nowhere. Uh, we're looking at, um, in, in none of these cases, are women bringing in as much as even 40% uh, of the total. On the other hand, their contributions are quite substantial, and we would have reason to believe that they're very important as we think about patterns of household well-being. I don't think I've said this yet, but uh, I should have. This includes non-earners. So this is the entire population of uh, working age people within that uh, age group. So one more time here, we did the picture once more, and this time this is for households, and only households uh, limited to those in which um, the female partners have non-zero earnings. So you find a somewhat similar story. Yet again, now it goes up, but the highest that we see uh, is still, no matter how you cut this, in other words, you're gonna find the same result which is that women are reaching parity in none of these countries, um, but their income is a really important contributor. In the Western, Central, and Northern European countries, the women's contributions are substantially larger, but they reach 50 nowhere. Um, a very quick aside, I'm not taking account of the value of non-market work. Uh, I've done that in other studies. A lot of these women who are not in the labor force are doing a lot of non-market work at home, childcare, domestic work, and now that's producing goods, and those goods are being consumed, uh, and we can value them and add them in, and then of course the picture would change, but that's a whole different story. Okay, um, very quickly then I'm gonna show you, I've got a lot of pictures here, but I'm not gonna show you too many of them. I'm gonna show you just three last pictures and then say a little tiny bit about public policy. So my colleagues and I, I'm gonna show you three pictures, one on inequality, one on poverty, and one on the middle class. And we did the same thing each time. It's just a thought experiment, or what you might call an accounting exercise. It's very common in this kind of literature, which is that you look at an income, you look at some kind of an outcome, and then you back out some component of the income package and just simply recalculate. So it's very commonly done, for example, to look at income inequality with, and with, with before taxes and transfers and after taxes and transfers. For those of you who know this literature, that's done a lot. It's sort of a proxy for state effort. But remember, it's an accounting exercise. It doesn't take it, it doesn't, it assumes no behavioral responses, obviously, if you withdraw large portions of income, right? People will behave differently. But we're not doing that. What we simply did is we look at income inequality uh, in this particular case, and then we just subtract out mechanically women's earnings and ask what happens, essentially. So this is our, our analytic uh, 
angle on the question about our women's earnings equalizing or disequalizing. And what you can see in the right-hand picture, the blue bar, that's just the simple Gini coefficient you've all probably seen many times, 0.33 in the US, which is quite high. Uh, the angle, and lower in most of the other Anglophone countries, much lower, again, in the Nordic countries uh, and in parts of Europe. The light blue bar next to it is we recalculate the income inequality, but this time we've subtracted, just literally mechanically subtracted the women's earnings. And what you see here then, uh, so for example, in the US, if you took out the women's earnings, the Gini coefficient would go from 33 to 38. So it's between about three and eight points, percentage points of inequality are removed in this particular um, framework. Let me, oops, poverty. Uh, we asked the same question, is our women's earnings Mitigating poverty, what's the result there? And in fact, we find almost exactly the same thing Look at the US, the poverty rate is about 15%. If you took out the women's earnings, it would rise to 22. That's an enormous difference. If you take out the transfers, it would go to 24. So the point being is that, um, just to move to the, to the conclusion here, and then I'm gonna take a minute and a half to say something about public policy. What we found here across these countries is a very clear finding, and in other European countries, as well that are in this paper is that women's contribution to household income while gender gaps remain persistent everywhere. We've looked at this over time. This is obviously a cross-section. They are very important for reducing inequality across households and for mitigating poverty. So what's the policy story that could be told here in one minute and 10 seconds? Um, you know, I this, I've worked for many, many years on policies that shore up women's employment. So I'm not going to show you anything empirically, but I'm just going to, what I'm going to tell you is not especially controversial and I think is really widely known at this point. Um, there's a, a very large literature on the policies that increase women's employment rates and for the most part strengthen women's employment uh, on other indicators as well. And the U.S. is a laggard on almost all of these policies relative to the rich countries not relative to Latin America, but relative to almost all of the countries, certainly Canada, Australia, and nearly all of the countries in the European Union. Um, so here's what we've learned in recent years. In 1984, if you looked at women's labor force participation rates across the 20 richest countries of the world, the United States was ranked fifth from the top. So we were a high, high female employment country. The countries above us were the, were the Nordic countries famous for their very strong emphasis on women's employment. By 2015, across those same 20 countries, um, the U.S. rank has fallen from 5th to 16th. And among highly educated women, tertiary education women were dead last. Now what happened there? Women's employment uh, rose, oh my gosh, I'm not going to forgive you, clock here. One more minute. Women's employment rose through most of the post-war period level that has fallen slightly in the U.S., but the important story is that almost all of the other countries in Europe, these other 19 countries that are now really climbing ahead of us, they've put these work-family reconciliation policies in place over a period of decades. Um, they've enacted new policies and strengthened the ones that they have. The key ones are uh, paid family leave. What we've learned that has increased women's employment rates, highly paid and not excessively long leave. They've invested a lot in public child care. They've put in rights to flexible work time. They've adjusted their tax systems and their school hours. Um, there were all kinds of structural changes that were made. Why? Because they were concerned about demographic changes and about uh, pressures on social insurance systems. The United States has done virtually uh, none of this. And that's partly why women's labor force attachment is um, lagging. It's why the capacity of women to mitigate poverty and inequality is lagging relative to other countries. Um, the science is there. There's very little mystery about which policies strengthen women's employment. What we're lacking is not the science in the United States, but the political will. I'm Katie Lyon with CUNY, um, CUNY Central. Yeah, hi. Um, the New York Times just had an article about how um, the excessively long work hours that are expected and the uh, payoff for that are sort of encouraging people to make the decision that the woman will work less and the man will take that higher paying job with, you know, 80 hours. Um, so. 
to me, there's also like a labor market component, not just a policy component. Or I was wondering if you think that's related and if policy can address that as well. It absolutely can, and that's absolutely correct. So the U.S. has very long work hours across the rich countries. About uh, most people have long work hours because you work more days per year uh, as opposed to more hours per day, right? But in all European countries, have a minimum of four weeks of paid annual leave a year. Uh, in the U.S., we have zero. Um, our work week also tends to be long. We do work long hours, and it caught, and it, it um, how to say this simply, it leads to exactly the result that was in that article, which is specialization. So, you know, in other words, it's very, a lot of young couples say, oh, we're each gonna work 30 hours a week for a really high quality job. You know, I would say, what's well, rough. I mean, there are very few high quality jobs at 30 hours a week. So some people work at 60 and some people work at zero. And yes, who lives and works at zero. So that's a, a stylized answer to that. But um, in many European countries, uh, there are lots of laws that have reduced average work hours, maximum work hours, and have given people statutory rights to reduce their work hours. And that's the point, is to create a, a greater prevalence of high quality reduced hour work so you don't get that result. Housing and Economic Development Corporation. Um, I'm wondering if you've also studied in this paper or otherwise um, how women's employment and contributions to the household income may have some sort of effect on educational attainment of their children and or feelings of self-empowerment. Feelings of what? Self-empowerment, which would also relate maybe to the happiness discussion mm. that, that happened earlier. Um, there, I'm, this I'm not an expert on. There was certainly research after the so-called welfare reform in the United States about women's perceived sense of worth uh, after moving from public assistance into employment. The, the, there was a, uh, some finding that sort of employment per se is good for women as long as the quality of the employment is above a certain threshold. Um, I would say, um, so yes, and, and I think, I mean, there's certainly studies that also show that children um, tend to report uh, good outcomes in households where both parents or all, the, or all the adults in the household are employed as long as the parents are not bringing home a story of tremendous stress. So I don't know our happiness psychologists might know more about this than I am, but I've seen some very intriguing findings. People think that children are stressed out when their parents work long hours, but at least in ethnographic research, the children are only stressed out when the parents come home and report that they're stressed out. So it's kind of a complicated interplay between the quality of work and the reaction to the work. Not with my area of expertise. Were you able to differentiate in your research the differences between um, people of color, or the color of black woman, in your research? In the and well, attribution to the household. You know, that's an excellent question. In, cro um, in this work, no. I've done some work in the U.S. Um, almost all of my work is across countries and usually across large numbers of countries, like 14 or 20 or 30 or more. And it's really, uh, it's a sad reality. It's very, very difficult to study race or ethnicity across countries because, the, first of all, the categories are different everywhere and the meaning is different everywhere. So um, it, it's, it's a really important question that you asked. There is a lot of work on racial differences in much of what I'm talking about in the United States, but I haven't done that much of it. Um, I've tried to look, for example, at migrants and non-migrants across countries, but it brings tremendously complicated questions. But, you know, what does it mean to be Dominican in New York as opposed to Moroccan in the Netherlands or Turkish in Germany? So we can identify people who are, you know, sort of quote minorities, but it's very, very hard to discern whether it has the same uh, social or economic institutional meaning across countries. So that's why, unfortunately, in almost all this cross-national research, while we can look a lot at gender and class, it's very difficult to, to look intelligently at either at race, ethnicity, or, or migration status. Could you microphone? Sorry. In the countries on the left, were you able? Can you make distinction between indigenous groups and others? Uh, in most of these data sets, no, uh, no, not in these particular data sets. Um, there, in the Brazilian data set, we can look at race, 
And in fact, the patterns of racial disparity in Brazil do look very much like what we see in the United States. Um, so, but it's a, it's a, again, it's a very problematic question um, across these countries. So, unsatisfying, I know. Hi, Jeannie Alter from Kennedy Children's Center. Um, just shifting gears a little bit, you said that the political will, it, that the answers are very clear, or the policies are somewhat clear. Um, and as we're looking towards 2020 and a growing field of candidates and statements on policy, is there one out of the very five or six that you mentioned before that you think has the most chance to actually be a policy statement that would make the biggest difference in the data as you look at it? Well, um, let's see. The most of the, uh, there's an awful, we're going to be hearing a huge amount in the next year, which I think is extremely exciting, obviously. Um, and some of the candidates have been quite specific about policy. I think we know who those are, and some, you know, a little, a little less so. There's been much more discussion about inequality than there has been about shoring up women's employment. You know, we've certainly got a proposal on the table about a high end wealth tax and high end income taxes, the kind of thing that our speaker was talking about earlier. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of interest in what's called, what some people call pre-distribution, meaning policies, mechanisms that would actually reduce disparities in market income, rising the minimum, raising the minimum wage, livable wage, there's some talk about ca uh, uh, capping earnings at the top. So there's a lot out there. We're not hearing terribly much yet about policies that would show up women's employment. We heard a lot last time um, because Hillary's campaign really was quite specific on this and her chief economist was also very interested in that. And they were talking a lot about universal pre-K, putting wages in the family and medical leave. So we haven't heard much of that, but I must say, since I've been working on this, I've been getting a lot of phone calls and queries from congressional staff and from some of the staff of the candidates. So I think we're going to hear more, probably, putting wages in the family and medical leave. That's the most likely. And universal pre-K uh, with some kind of national level funding. Those two would be enormously important in bringing us in line with other so I think we will we will hear that, but we haven't heard too much yet.